What a wonderful, awesome God you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Jesus, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we magnify you. Lord, we lift your name. Lord, we lift your name. Jesus, we lift your name. Holy Spirit, we lift your name. Oh, Riga bala gada ruda bala la raga la raude. Shaka bala gada ruda rabala rajale raude ruda baba raga leo. Blood of Jesus, hallelujah. 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 Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the sixth evening of our congregational prayer and fasting. Thank you, Lord, for the awesome time of worship where the heaven has come down and enjoying the commune with you, O oh Jesus, O oh God. So tonight, O oh God, this evening, as we have come to your presence, O oh God, I pray the Lord who stood with us the day one till today. Father, this evening, you have another level of anointing for us, O oh God. You are going to speak to us. You are going to touch us wherever your people are, Lord. Especially in this COVID-19 pandemic third wave season, we pray, O oh God, the people of house of prayer is protected by the blood of Jesus. We cancel death. We cancel sicknesses. We cancel accidents. We cancel affliction. Any sorrows, misfortune. Anyone losing life, just jobs. Anything we cancel it, O God, in the name of Jesus. We pray unity, love, tranquility, peace upon each one of us, O God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This evening, O God, wherever your people are listening, the power of God is released upon them, O God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We continue to commit the servant of God in your hand. Speak to us through your servant. Bless, O God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord and good evening, church. The Lord is good all the time. And the Lord is good and that is his nature. Of season will change situations will change but the Lord remains unchanged the same yesterday today and forever amen thank God for his grace from the day one till today on the sixth evening of our congregational prayer and fasting the Lord is to do with us we want to say thank you to the Lord and for all the miracles God has performed our lives Beloved church, we are covering you in prayer. Take care and God is with us. And just to know tomorrow we are having our service as per the government regulations. It will be strictly one hour service. As we break our fast, we will have a, it will be a packed service, a worship, holy communion and a few minutes to share the word and receive the word and we'll leave the place of sanctuary. So don't forget tomorrow nine hours, sharp nine hours at the church. Tonight, I don't want to waste our uh, time this evening. Again, our own brother, the man of God, an anointed servant of God who has ministered many times in the house of prayer. One of our men from the men's ministry and a dedicated teacher for the teens ministry in house of prayer. Brother Kamso Muleya is going to deliver the word. Brother, we are happy to have you. Let's welcome the man of God, Brother Kamso Muleya, to come and minister the word of God on the sixth evening of our prayer and fasting. Welcome brother. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Honor belongs to God. Dominion and power belongs to Jesus. We thank God for today. Pastor, thank you very much. Uh, it's always an honor to stand before a, God, a great congregation like this one. And um, just share the word of God. Praise be to God. Father, we give you praise. We honor you. We magnify your name, dear Lord. You are great. Everything about you is great. Indeed, Jehovah God, this is a day that you have made for us. And you have prepared for us, O oh God, that we should feast at your table. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. 
the Lord, we shall be blessed, and that the word shall bring forth healing, for your word says that you sent forth the word and healed their disease. Amen and amen. Today we are going to look at uh, a topic that um, I have entitled Whose Report Will You Believe? Whose Report Will You Believe? You know, life can bring us to places where we do not expect. And sometimes these things happen suddenly. Sometimes these things happen gradually. The good thing is that God always has something to say. Hallelujah. God always has something to say. Today we shall start our reading from Luke 8. Luke chapter 8 and verse uh, 41. We shall read 41 and 42. Then we shall jump to 49 uh, up to 56. So Luke chapter 8 and... Uh, Verse 41 says, Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at the feet, at, at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Pleading with him to come to his house. Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. When you read the same account uh, <coughs> from Matthew, the Bible says, he said, my daughter is dead. Okay? So, uh, when we jump to verse 49... The Bible says, when, while Jesus was speaking, while Jesus was speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, do not be afraid. Just believe. She will be healed. When he arrived at the house, Jairus, I mean, as when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for, for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he looked, I mean, but he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. There are a few things that I would love us to look at concerning this issue. Jesus Christ was moving. He was doing everything. He was busy with his business. And here comes a man by the name of Jairus. Now, you have to understand who Jairus was. The Bible says that he was the ruler of the temple. When you hear that Jairus was the ruler of the temple, meaning that he was among the people that were, uh, that threw Jesus out of the temple when he proclaimed to them that I am the Christ. When he quoted from Isaiah saying, this verse has become true. He was among the people that uh, were 
against what Jesus was doing because the ministry of Jesus had not yet been fully accepted. But he was faced with a crisis. And being a ruler of the temple, these are people that were feared because they had authority. When we talk about authority, these are the people that could order for an arrest. These are people that could order even for some people to be killed. When you read in the book of Acts, these are the people that actually put Peter, Paul, and uh, the other disciples in great trouble. They were the ones that were initiating those beatings. They were not the Roman soldiers, no. These are the Jews, the rulers of the temple that we are doing all that was being done. And this man was faced with the crisis. And when he was faced with the crisis, he sat down and realized who Christ was. Today, I want to speak to you to say, it does not matter what you have done in the past. It does not matter who you have offended in the past. You might be one that had spoken against Christ. You might be one who has actually mocked the power of the Holy Spirit. You might be one that has done strange things and you are faced with a crisis. The important thing at that moment is do you recognize who Christ is? The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. In short, it's saying you shall have knowledge. You shall interact. You shall be familiar with the truth. And it is this kind of interaction with this truth, this communion with the truth that sets you free. And Jesus Christ said, this is eternal life that they may know you and the Christ whom you have sent. Who is the Christ? Jesus said of himself when he testified, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. In short, he is saying, when you have known who Christ is, when you have had a revelation of who Christ is, what you have done in the past does not matter. Jairus might have been among the people that opposed the manifestation of the Christ, but in the time of Christ, he realized and recognized who Jesus was. And this time around, he went not in a capacity as the ruler of the synagogue, but he went to Jesus in his capacity as Lord of Lords, as King of Kings, and as a healer and as God. And the Bible says that he came to him. In the book of Matthew, it records and says he bowed before him. In short, he worshipped the man that they had chased out of a temple. I want to talk to you today. I'm saying, look, you might be feeling guilty. The devil has a way in which he brings out your past and digs it out and brings it out to you. But it is a time that you look at Christ. What is the revelation that you have about Christ now? Is it not written that now faith is? Faith is not about the past. Faith is not about what you hear in the future. Faith is about now. What is it that you have seen now? What is the revelation of the Christ that you have seen now? So that's where you begin to move. That's where now you begin to act upon. And this man had seen what Christ had done. He had realized who Christ is based on the testimonies and maybe hearing the teachings of the Christ from the time they had rejected him to this particular time and he knew where the source of solution is and he went to Christ. If you want to see a miracle in your life, if you want to overcome impossibilities in your life, when the time comes, surely a time will come, a time of an impossibility. If you have never seen it, you are yet to see it unless you do not save God because hell will break loose against you. But when there's a time of impossibilities, that's when the God who sorts out uh, impossibilities, it may manifest. Otherwise, if there is no time in your life when you have an impossibility, that God will never manifest. The second thing we can learn from Jairus is that he did not consider who he was. The Bible says, no man, no flesh shall glory in the presence of God. It was unheard of for a ruler of the synagogue to bow before a man. But he bowed before a carpenter because that's who they knew him to be. They said, who is this Jesus? Is he not the son of Joseph? Is he not the son of a carpenter? As long as they saw a carpenter in Christ, they would not see a God. They would not see the Lord. They would not see a healer. 
But Jairus had the revelation of whom the Christ is. And when he went before him, he did not go before a carpenter. He went through before Christ. Many a time, an altar call is called in the church. And you fail to come and bow before the Lord. Because you are looking at a young man preaching. You are looking at the pastor that you have uh, shared food with. You are looking at who's going to see me, who's going to do what. Jairus was among people of low repute when he came before Jesus because it was rare that you would find high class people to follow Jesus Christ. He was followed by those that were poor, those that were uh, the tax collector, the prostitutes, the thieves, those that uh, saw hope in him because the synagogue did not offer them hope. Neither did the Romans. But Jairus, a man of high reputation, came and bowed before Christ in the midst of those that he despised. If you have to see miracles in your life, if you have to see impossible situations sorted out in your life, you have to become a man who doesn't care about what people think about you, but what the Father feels about you and knows about you. You should not be afraid to express yourself or to show what you know about this Jesus. Because he says, if you are ashamed of me in public, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus' response is very interesting. He does not remind him of the past. He does not tell him to say, look, after all, you are a ruler. After all, you are a pastor. After all, you are what? He says, let's go. Now, I want to tell you that every time when something great is about to happen, there are some people that are going to manifest in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Jairus came to Jesus, he had hope. And when he had hope, because his child was sick, though the, the sickness was at a point where uh, the child was almost dying, in Mark it says, my child is at the point of death. But he had hope because there was life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But as Jesus was going and he was still speaking to, to some people, the Bible says that another man came from the house of Jairus and said to him, Master, your child is dead. Do not bother the master anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The child is dead. Do not bother the master anymore. The first thing that might come to distract you is the thing that kills your hope. You have been told that uh, there are job interviews somewhere and as you are trying to prepare to go and the phone call comes and says, look, uh, the interview is already over, so <laughs> there's nothing you can do anymore. Hallelujah. There are times when even the little hope that you had is taken away. When the child was still alive, you have heard that Jesus does heal. But he has not yet heard that Jesus does raise from the dead. And this report comes. It is true. It's not a lie. It has happened. The child has died. And the situation becomes impossible. It is unheard of. He has been sentenced to life imprisonment. That's it. No, you have 
HIV and AIDS. You've got coronavirus. And sometimes when you are hoping for the best and the situation just becomes bad. What do you do? The second enemy that will come, the enemy to your miracle or breakthrough will be the voice of reason. Do not bother the master anymore. Why? Because where the situation is now, there is nothing that you can do. The child is dead. There is no more life to heal in her. The worst has happened. My brother, you've been praying that you want a job, you want to get this job, and then you come home one day and you find that uh, the thieves broke in and they have stolen your papers and you don't know where to start from. There is no hope. You've got a court case and you go there and everything has gone and then suddenly the witness that needed to help you and the like, they decide to do a 180 on you and they have turned against you. You have no money, you have no what. People who are powerful are fighting you and you look at it and people come and tell you, look my brother, no one has ever worn this kind of a curse. Just leave it. Pick yourself up and start moving. You are innocent, you know it, but you get to work and then there is a firing, let us say go. And you realize you don't have anywhere to go. And you try to fight here and there, you try to pray and you look at a situation, you say, look, I have prayed, I'm done. How many times have we given up? Because the situation comes to a point where we look at it and we say, this is finished. I mean, I'm not going there anymore. David, for example, he prayed for his, for his son. Prayed, fasted seven days. He was so broken inside to a point whereby his servants could not even tell him when the child died. They thought if he's like this in his sickness, what will happen in his death? And when the child died, David said, ah, there's nothing I can do. He stopped. And most of us get to that point. You are believing for something. You really, really know this should happen. This should happen. And at the point where you believe the breakthrough will come, and then the situation just turns for the worst. The child is dead. And the voice comes to you saying, concerning this situation, stop praying. Even if you pray, it has already happened. And at times, we listen to the voice of reason because the reasoning is so, it makes sense. Hallelujah. It makes a lot of sense. But there's something that's very interesting. Amidst that loud voice, because there's a way such news will hit you, it, it just deafens your ears. The child is dead. Immediately, what hits you just goes the other way around. But there was an interesting part. As this voice was coming in, the Bible says, Jesus said to him, fear not, only believe. Hallelujah. Only believe. Child of God, there is always a word that God has to say concerning your situation. Always. If it's something that has happened and he's in charge, he'll tell you, peace be still, it's okay. You will find calmness. The Bible says that do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, make your request known to the Lord. He's the one who gives us the peace that's beyond understanding. If it is of the Lord, he'll give you that peace. But if you pay attention, this is why it's very important for every child of God to learn to listen to the voice of God. He will speak only believe. And the Bible says, faith 
comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. It is in such times when there is no hope. The Bible says that Abraham believed God. He hoped against hope. When all hope is gone, even the little, little spark that was showing is gone, when the light has gone, when everything else has gone, the only light, the only life, the only breath you have is dependent on that still voice that God always speaks. The unfortunate part is that the bad news has got a louder voice. This is why it is important as a child of God to learn to find that quiet time. In the midst of all commotions, you must be able to hold yourself and listen. What is Jesus saying concerning this situation? For we are not of those that move by sight, but we move by faith. How do we move by faith? Faith cometh by hearing. My sheep hear my voice. You shall hear a voice telling you, do not go this way, go that way. Why? Because they that are led by the Spirit of the Lord, the same are the children of God. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? This is a provision. It's your right. It's your nature in God to hear his voice in such times. Hallelujah. No miracle will ever happen without an impossibility coming to be. When it hits a point where a man says, hey, it is done. Listen to what Jesus has to say. Hallelujah. Before I go to the next uh, stage, I'm prompted to share a testimony. There was a time in the early 2000s when my father had a problem with his spine. Went to UTH, they said nothing can be done. We moved around, they said nothing can be done. And uh, we advised to go to some Italian hospital in, um, in Lusaka. And when we went there, ma in fact it was mom who went, that time I was still a young boy, I was still very young, so mom was doing the running about. I went into prayer. And as I was praying in everything, the voice kept on speaking in my head saying, because he is a righteous man, I shall raise him from his sick bed. Because he is a righteous man, I shall raise him from his sick bed. When mom came, I remember I was seated down. I was so broken, I couldn't stand up. I said, what did the doctor say? She said, the doctor said, uh, he cannot be fixed. He will never walk. The best they can do is do an operation that will ease the pain, but he will remain paralyzed halfway and he will be moving on a wheelchair. I said, okay. But you, when you were at the hospital, the Lord said to me that because he is a righteous man, he shall rise him from his sick bed. We stopped going to hospital. We began to give him painkillers and we began to pray. Long story short, two years down the line, I saw my father running, chasing animals, falling down and rolling over and stood up and he was laughing and I remembered that day. That voice. Always find it as a child of God. It's always there. If you've never heard it in time of crisis, it's because you did not pay attention. In Psalm 50, God says, listen, my people, and I shall speak. He's always speaking. He's got something to say in every situation. Pay attention. It's there. The next obstacle that Jairus faced was when they got to his home. The Bible says that they found people who were wailing, people who were crying. There was evidence of a funeral. When you are faced with a challenge, there is always evidence. And the Bible says that when they reached, Jesus Christ said, stop crying for the child 
is not dead. The Bible says that they laughed at him. There are mockers. When you are believing God for something, there are people that will mock you. This generation, according to the book of Jude, is the generation of mockers. They will laugh at you. You will be walking and you don't have shoes, yet you are believing God and praying. And they will try to tell you, look, if you do this, you will get money. Why don't you accept to be bribed? You are a police officer. You don't want to be bribed. Why are you living like that? You are this and that. And people are flourishing. The Bible says in Psalm uh, 73, it says, do not be envious of the wicked. Why? Because they prosper. And you are there. Two years, you are telling them, the Lord will bless me. Three years, my Lord will bless me. Ten years, the Lord will bless me. And they are laughing at you. Where is your God? Even Jesus Christ, at the point of breakthrough, when he was at the cross, the Bible does not say he made a public spectacle of them when he cast out demons, when he walked on water, or when he raised the dead. No, it says at the cross, at the point where it was the hardest. That's where Jesus had the victory. And when he was at the cross, the Bible tells me that the mockers appeared. The mockers appeared. I've been in, I've been in places I preach. I lay hands on the people and they get healed. And I come out and someone says, you call yourself a man of God. How come you are still sneezing? How come this? How come your mother is still sick? How come you can't? Praying for people and they get jobs and people's businesses are going up and they still look at you and they say, but you, what have you, what do you have to show for it? That's exactly what they say to Jesus on the cross. You healed others. Why don't you save yourself? Mockers will come. Your family members will tell you you are being stupid. Your friends are doing A, B, C, D. You, you are climbing mountains to go and pray. I'm not saying you should only pray and not work. No, I'm saying that there are things that you, you know that the Spirit of God has convicted you and you are doing it. And mockers will laugh at you. Friends will laugh at you when it is at the point where things are difficult and the situation looks impossible. A story I read somewhere of a woman in Nigeria whose husband died three days in the morgue and she heard that the great evangelist Reinhard Bonke was there and she demanded that his body be taken there and people laughed at her. People mocked her. She remained and said it should be done. Lo and behold, when they brought the husband there, long story short, he was raised from the dead. Watch out for mockers. But what is interesting is this. In the book of Matthew, it says, Jairus put away the people. When you are in such a place, it's time for you to walk alone. Only with the people that you trust. Not everybody you call brother. Not everybody you call sister. Not even sister in the Lord is an ally in times of war. Even Jesus could only allow three of his disciples to follow him. I pray that God will open your eyes. That God will give you grace to know who your true allies are. Some people will stand with you and pray with you and even initiate overnights in your home to come and pray. And you think that these are allies. All they want is to be so close to the story so that they can go and gossip. May God give you eyes to see. There are some Judases in the, I mean, around us at times. Not everybody who speaks in tongues and speaks like they're encouraging you. Uh, they, are, they are there in mocking you. It looks like an encouragement, but they are actually mocking you. I pray that, Lord, you shall 
give us grace as house of prayer that we shall know our true allies in times of hardness when things look impossible in Jesus mighty name. It would have been very easy for Darius for Jairus to say look move away. Look, Jesus, I think you've done enough. Look, you've made me a laughing stock. You see, I, I'm a man of great repute. You know, uh, look at my, my friends. They are, they, they, are, they are Pharisees here. They are priests here. And, uh, you, and look, people are laughing. Uh, you, uh, he didn't care. He put them away. Those were his friends, his relatives, people that cared for him. He had lost a child and they were there to sympathize with him. And they were there crying and actually amplifying the facts and the truth of the matter. But they did not realize that Darius had moved in the dimension in which he was moving in. I didn't want to explain this, but let me explain it to you this way. The Bible says that in, uh, in Peter, it says that he has, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and power. Now, he says that through the knowledge of these promises in the Bible, we become partakers of his divine nature. What is his divine nature? His divine nature is that God is eternal. What does it mean when it says God is eternal? It means that God is outside time. Time is a creation. God is not a creation. So he is outside of time. Meaning that with God, when, when, what is in time? To God is like yesterday is as good as today. Today is as good as yesterday. You can prove that from scripture. You find that Isaiah will speak of tomorrow like it happened yesterday. He will speak of yesterday like it happened tomorrow. When you read the book of Revelation, you find that it is written in past tense. Yes, it had not yet happened. Then you say, how is it like that? It is because when you begin to enter into life, Jesus Christ says, them believed in me has entered into life. He has entered into life. And when you enter into the spiritual realm, the spirit of faith, you discover that you move from the time zone, you enter into the eternal zone. When you enter into the eternal zone, anything is possible. Hallelujah. Anything is possible. Meaning that what could be true here on earth, it can be altered in the eternal zone. So, Jesus Christ, the Bible says he died before the foundations of the earth, yet he was made manifest at another time. So, every time when you enter into the eternal uh, place, the spiritual realm in heaven, in, the, in, in Ephesians it says that he has made everything uh, good. He has given it to us in the heavenly places. Heavenly places is not talking about stars and moons like in the moon or somewhere on a star. There are cars and there are farms and there are no. It talks about a higher dimension than the natural that we know. So when you get by faith by the spirit of the Christ, you get into this dimension where there we operate in faith. What, it, what happens is that at that point when we are born again, when we are baptized, when we take Holy Communion, it's not a symbol. It's actually us dying with Christ. It's, we become one. That's how we access these spiritual gifts, these spiritual issues. So when Darius was moving with the Christ, he had entered into the dimension of faith. And in the dimension of faith, the Bible says that those that are in Christ have escaped death meaning that death has no power there. I don't know what you are going through. Naturally, it may not make sense. Naturally, it may not make sense. There's nothing that can be done. But by the spirit of faith, like Jesus told Peter, if you have faith, 
you can speak to this mountain and it can move. Naturally, voices don't move mountains. But in the spirit of faith, mountains move. The question that I have for us this evening is, whose report will you believe concerning your situation? You may have been told, look, in your family we don't get married. So, look, you are turning 30, you are going to 40, you never have a child. Get pregnant, have a child and leave. And Jesus Christ is saying, he will do it for you. The question is, which voice are you listening to? Hallelujah. I believe that there are some of us that may be having challenges right now. Wherever you are listening from, wherever you are watching from, I pray that listen to what the voice of faith is speaking to you right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray. We pray, dear God, that every challenge, every impossibility that has manifested its face upon your children today, Lord, may you release a word. For your word says that, and he sent forth his word, and he healed their disease. Your word is a fire, dear Heavenly Father. We pray that where the enemy has planted wrong seed, let your fire consume. Your word, dear Lord, is a hammer. I pray today that, Father, wherever the enemy has erected a wall, let your word break. Your word is spirit. Your word is life. Lord, we pray for those that are facing a challenge of sickness, dear Lord, disease. I pray healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Locate them wherever they are. Eish. You who called, dear Lord, fish to enter Peter's net, I pray, dear Lord, for revival in the businesses of your people. In Jesus' mighty name, during these seven days of prayer and fasting, those that are praying for businesses, I pray for that anointing of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Remember, Lord, that I've sacrificed, Lord, like you remember Jehovah God, Master Cornelius. Jehovah, you are king. Jehovah, you are Lord. We pray, dear Lord, tomorrow, even as we break the bread, you say in your word that do this in remembrance of me. Father, we pray that the benefit of the cross shall be for each one of us in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for who you have made us to be. We glorify your name. We honor you now and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, brother. That powerful revelation on the sixth evening, the Lord has challenged us whose report are we believing beloved saints of God there are many newses many informations about current crisis and what we are going through but let's believe the report of Jesus hallelujah thank you brother Mulea thank you for the word may the Lord bless you I am not taking any more time tomorrow nine hours sharp nine we will meet at the church. 
at Ndola Kanini Yoke, 13029 Duclos Kanini. Since it's a one hour service, make sure, beloved saints of God, we are seated five minutes before nine hours at church. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord release His grace upon you. You are healed. Your prayers are answered as you have been praying. Tomorrow we are coming to celebrate and rejoice for the testimonies God has done. As you are still waiting upon the Lord tonight, expect a divine encounter wherever you are. Angelic visitation wherever you are. The Lord will see you through. Lord will visit you tonight. May the Lord bless you. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the man of God. Greater revelation you have released to us and encouraging us before we break the fast tomorrow. We must believe the report of Jesus. We pray for your servant, Mule and the family. Bless the ministry, career, bless O God. In the house of the congregation, even we insulate them under the blood of Jesus. Under the blood of Jesus. Under the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen and amen. Brother, once again, thank you, church. May God bless you, saints of God, wherever you are watching. God bless you. See you tomorrow, sharp nine at church. May God bless you.